Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Can you believe it? It's the final episode of season six, and I cannot believe how quickly this season has gone. It has been unhinged, inspiring, and full of human garbage people, and two very chaotic, chaotic, it's been so chaotic. (laughs) Two very chaotic trials of various species, but it has also been chock full with some amazing baddies and fantastic guests. Hey, this is Editing TK popping in here real quick to tell you about an amazing milestone that we have reached because of you, my delicious little donut. We had the highest number of episode downloads ever in the For the Love of History history. (laughs) We were 200 downloads shy of 6,000 downloads this month, which is absolutely banana sandwich. And I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. Okay, back to episode TK. (laughs) And to end this most magical of seasons, I thought that we could talk about a cult. (laughs) Great idea, right? But not just any cult. The Egyptian cult of Sobek. The alligator beefcake god himself. And just a little content warning real quick. This uh, topic might not be the best if you're listening at work. Ugh. We'll be talking about some bodily fluids, so you might want to get your headphones on or just terrorize your office. Either way, it's up to you, friend. So without further ado, let's get on to the season finale episode. Grab your antiperspirant. It'll It'll make sense later. And an offering to the alligator god so he doesn't eat you. And let's get to it. Close your eyes if you're able to. If you're not, please keep them open. (laughs) But I'd like you to picture this. A seven foot tall bodybuilder type dude with the head of an enormous crocodile. And on this dead-eyed reptile's noggin is the towering crown of Amun, with double cobras at its base. He has an insatiable hunger and a greedy appetite for horizontal activities. He seems to have no personality traits other than desire to eat and make babies. This is the god Sobek, one of the oldest gods in the Egyptian mythos. His origins are a little vague, but we do know that he was first worshipped in the Fayum Oasis, which is like a little green bloop that is right below the Nile Delta. And surprise, surprise, it was chock full of crocodiles. Worship of Sobek can be traced back to prehistoric times, but only was done locally in that little oasis place until a few centuries later. Sobek's mother is believed to be Neat, the creator goddess, the architect of the universe, and the creator of all gods who is said to personify the primeval waters that birthed Egypt itself. So she's like pretty much a badass in every way. Yay, neat. From her primeval waters emerged Sobek. And I think this might be... Immaculate Conception, right? Or are is this weird Zeus, Athena popping out of his brain kind of a thing, which I think would also be Immaculate Conception because there was no amorous Congress involved. I, these are the questions that keep me up at night. Anyways, I digress. He's born from the waters. Here comes Sobek out of the primeval waters, fully formed, fully beefed up, ready to eat, and ready to get himself involved in some bedsheet tango. <laughs> Let's see how many euphemisms I can come up with in this episode. Enter your guess now. Because of Sobek's one track mind, he was dubbed the Lord of Love Juice. I <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm serious. I'm so serious. He was the lord of a word that I cannot say. (laughs) Okay. It starts with an S and ends with an (laughs) E-man. You know what I'm talking about. He was the lord of that. His, um, his baby gravy was 
uh, apparently quite abundant, but in, in kind of a weird way. Another one of his monikers was he who steals wives. He was like the Mr. Steal Your Girl of the Egyptian gods. And although he had ladies falling all over themselves to get a chance to shake the sheets with him, he never had any children with them. Like he literally was with the premier goddess of fertility, Hathor, and yet no babies. She had babies. He did not have babies with her. And even though he had no little gods or goddesses of his own, he was apparently responsible for spawning all of the crocodiles in Egypt, which is enough children for any god. How he made those little crocodile babies, uh, I have no idea. And I'm pretty, pretty okay with not knowing how. <laughs> is it mitosis? Did he separate? I, do, I don't know. <laughs> And so Beck's body fluid fun didn't stop with his special downstairs sauce. <laughs> I hate myself. I'm sorry. And I got, okay, so I got to pause really quick and tell you about this lovely historian that I was watching on YouTube. He, he was amazing. He was talking about all of this stuff and he was very straight, deadpan, no reaction, not a giggle or a smirk. He was talking about all of this as if, <laughs> As if he was like telling you about the weather and I applaud him because I cannot deal. I absolutely cannot deal with this. And I feel like a tween in sex ed class, but I will compose myself and move on to tell you about Sobek's other powerful body fluid, his sweat. Yes, dear one, Sobek's sweat was apparently so strong and so abundant that some believe him responsible for the creation of the Nile freaking river. The whole thing is from his sweat, which is so gross when you think about it. I'm just picturing these ancient Egyptians <laughs> talking to each other. What are you watering your crops with? Sobek sweat. What are you taking a bath in? Sobek sweat. What are you drinking? Sobek sweat, which is hilarious because in Japan there is in fact a drink called Pokati sweat and I will only be able to think about Sobek now. It is officially Sobek sweat from here on out. So our good pal Sobek was full of all sorts of powerful fluids and was having a great time being locally worshipped, but during the 12th dynasty he caught his first big break. The first written evidence we have of Sobek is in this freaking cool thing called the Pyramid Text, which just on its own already sounds really cool, but it's even cooler when you find out that it's a collection of spells and funeral rites for pharaohs and queens, which is so cool. And even cooler, you can get the Pyramid Text in book form now, which is number one on my two-buy list, but I digress. In the Fayum region, Sobek was worshipped in local temples and smaller places, but during the 12th dynasty, roughly 4,000-ish years ago, the pharaohs were like, hey, we need to like start up some agriculture and infrastructure work to like make our capital city super great and like get us some more agricultural productivity. So that's what they did. It was a huge grand project, huge even compared to construction today. And they also thought that they would need to build some temples to appease the gods to make this region super rad. The pharaoh Amenhat III took this very seriously and started building temples to local deities. And following what I assume is <laughs> Sobek's life motto, the pharaoh went big and did not go home. The largest of the temples Amenhat III created was Sobek's. It was a huge building that housed a pool in the center for all of Sobek's little children, aka the crocodiles, and one very special crocodile. One that was raised straight out of the egg and treated like a literal god because this crocodile was raised in captivity and fed a constant buffet of beer, bread, and meat it was very chill. So chill, in fact, that it seemed to have no problem being covered in gold and jewels all the time. But unfortunately, for the crocodile, just like any other aristocratic person back in the Dizay who exclusively dined on delicacies, Mr. Fancy Pants Croc met an untimely death due to lots of medical problems and was mummified like a pharaoh. 
All throughout the Fayum region, Amenhat III and other pharaohs built built bleh, 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 bleh. <laughs> built many a temple in the name of Sobek in order to make their own ties to the gods stronger, and therefore their claim to the throne stronger in the eyes of the people who had been worshiping Sobek for a super duper long time. One of Sobek's peak godly times came when he was combined with the god of kingliness, Horus. And for the delicious donuts who are just listening and not watching, Horus is is the god with the with the hawk head. Oh, he's got a little beak too. He's he's a hawk. Okay. <laughs> so when I say combined, I really mean like combined. They like combounded. They combined the two gods. We're talking full hybrid homunculi situation. And now it's time for a pub quiz. Do you think? Horace Sobek was the head of a hawk and the body of a croc, or the head of a croc and the body of a hawk. I'll wait for your answer. If you said head of a hawk, body of a croc, you were correct. This combining two gods thingy was some very clever religious tricksy business. Because remember, Horus came after Sobek, right? And Sobek had been worshipped in the Fayum area for a century already. So by combining Horus, the god of kings, and Sobek, the main deity of this area, pharaohs were making themselves very much the most godly people in the land and instantly turning all the people who had been worshiping Sobek into Horus worshipers as well, essentially swearing their allegiance to the pharaoh and the government, which is all very clever. So just plain old Sobek was now Horus of the Fayum. But the god splicing didn't stop there. Good old Ra, the god of the sun, no big deal, also got in on the hybrid action. Sobek and Ra, sometimes called Ray, got shipped and their couple name was Sobek Ray. So creative. <laughs> but I guess our ship names now are not that clever. Like Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, Benifer, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Brangelina. The bar is pretty low, but I digress. So now our little lord of lovemaking and sweat was responsible for creating the Nile, all of the agricultural goodness of the Fayum, and directly connected to the pharaoh. And now he was responsible for making the sun itself rise in the sky each day, which was incredibly important to the Egyptians. He had a freaking killer resume, this guy. Now Sobek was no longer just a little local Mr. Steal Your Girl deity nay nay he was squarely in the center of the egyptian pantheon sobek's popularity reached a peak in the 12th dynasty and at its end his popularity waned a bit but he was still a major god to the people he was written about in the book of the dead which is super cool people pray to him all the time fishermen would pray to sobek constantly to protect them and all of that fun stuff so he was squarely in the hearts and minds of the people sobek's final peak kind of happened during the reign of the Ptolemies. You know the Ptolemies, you know those guys. The last dynasty of Egypt before the Greeks took over, they had Cleopatra, you know them, you love them, the Ptolemies. Okay, so during this time, 332 BCE to 30 BCE, which was like 2,000-ish years ago, the Ptolemies were all about the Fayum region again. They wanted to develop it again, and that meant allowing more people to come in through trade and different agreements. And that also meant there were people from all over the world coming to live there, especially the Greeks, who had now begun calling the Fayum Crocodilopolis. Crocodilopolis. This could this episode get any more strange? Baby gravy lords, sweat rivers, and now a city with the super ridiculous name Crocodilopolis. I know all words are made up, but this one 
sounds particularly made up. Anyways, so all these peeps were coming in to Crocodilopolis and Sobek's cult got its second wind. The Egyptian people were all about that Sobek worship and kind of holding on to their culture and heritage and the Sobek worship was taken to a new level. People began purchasing crocodiles to be sacrificed to Sobek and the demand for this became so high that a new crocodile breeding industry formed. Because Sobek wasn't particularly the god of any one thing, people would worship him and pray to him for a plethora of stuff. General protection, prosperity, money, agriculture, all sorts of things. But as all things do, the Ptolemaic dynasty came to an end with the tragic death of our good Judy, Cleopatra. The Greeks came in and the Egyptian gods went out. But why did the Egyptians worship such a terrifying creature in the first place, TK? I hear you asking. Thank you. Great question, my delicious little donut. As always, you come in hot with the critical thinking. It was totally true that crocs were one of the deadliest creatures in Egypt, along with like snakes and hippos. But those deadly little beasties were also worshipped in god form, with the super cute hippo goddess Tawaret being the goddess of protection and children, and the snake goddess Wajet is another goddess of protection and fertility. Worshipping the thing that could kill you in real life was kind of a way to harness that power and deadliness and all the other positive attributes that that animal animal possessed and use it for yourself. It was also a way to kind of exert some form of control over your environment. A hippo might eat you if you're in the river, but if you ask the hippo goddess to like chill out and not let her hippo people eat you, you might feel a little bit better. And if you're a fisherman who doesn't want to end up crocodile lunch, you might want to just like send up a quick prayer and be like, Sobek, can you keep your kids in check? Right? So Sobek, although scary and all powerful, was a god of the people and of the pharaohs. Egyptians from every walk of life worshipped him and did so for over four years thousand years. Now the Nile has been dammed up and the people of Egypt can roam the Nile free from fear of getting gobbled up by a Sobek baby. But that beefcake ladies man still lives on in mythology, video games, movies, and all sorts of things. And if you ever get a chance to go to Egypt, I hope you can swim in Sobek's glorious sweat river. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thoughts in the final episode of season six. And for our final thought today, I have a little bit of a teaser for you of an absolutely outrageous story that I found while I was researching for this episode. There are so many myths about Sobek, but one of my favorite is the myth of Sobek and the fish of chaos. My mom is here at the tail end of me researching for this episode, and I died. I died when I was reading about it, and I had to like check five or six different sources to make sure that this indeed was correct. I am going to upload the full story on Patreon. It'll be up by the time this episode posts, so if you want to hear the full story, you can go ahead and go, go, ahead and go join Patreon at any tier, but I'll give you a little teaser here. Okay, you ready? You ready for the chaos fish? Once upon a time in Egypt, Isis was super pissed at her son, Horus. Horus had magical hands, and in order to punish Horus for the awful thing that he did, Isis decided to take those hands and toss them in the Nile River. The god Ra saw all of this happening and was like, oh man, I feel so bad for Horus. That's like awful. I gotta do something. I don't want to piss off Isis, but I also want to help Horus. So what is a god to do? Ra gave it a thought and during his brainstorming, he realized that he could do a lot of things, but swim down to the bottom of the Nile was not one of them. However, he knew somebody who could. Can you guess who that someone who that someone was? You're right, Sobek. But it's not like Ra could just rock up to Sobek's palace in the Nile and be like, hey, can you go get these hands for me? Ra had to sweeten the deal and entice the crocodile god to want to get the hands because the hands 
were now in possession of the fish of chaos. And the fish of chaos had already made a fool of Sobek once. So the god Ra created a magical signet ring that he knew the crocodile god would want. And with the ring in his pocket, he began sailing down the river Nile to persuade the god of insatiable hunger to do him a little favor. And to find out the rest of the story, you can join us over on Patreon. Well, that is all she wrote, friend. I cannot thank you enough for joining me all throughout season six. This has been the best season that we've had in For the Love of History history. And I'm just... I'm so grateful that you've been here with me this entire time. I, I would not be here without you today. And I am continually in awe of your support and kind messages and birthday gifts that I got this year. I, I can't. Oh, I honestly think that my delicious donuts are the greatest people here on the internet. And I will gently fight anybody who says otherwise because I don't like conflict. But <laughs> I will get into a conflict about that. This season, we had so many guests. We started a YouTube channel, which is absolutely just so cool. It was one of my goals for this year, and I really appreciate anybody who has gone and subscribed. If you haven't yet, it would be just so, so wonderful if you could do that. Go, go head on over. The link is in the show notes. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. You know you want to. <laughs> So with season six coming to an end, I will be taking a bit of a break in the month of September and the very beginning of, of October. I'm aiming to have the season uh, seven up and ready by the second week of October. We shall see how that goes. And speaking of season seven, you can go on over to Instagram this week to vote on the topic polls for season seven. Participation in the topic polls and on Instagram in general is super duper helpful in appeasing the algorithm gods as well as leaving a rating or review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. And speaking of support, if you'd like, you can join Patreon. That would be super great. In the month of October, I will be telling some spooky Halloween tales from Japan and other places around the world. And we'll also be doing some other fun things over there. There's merch discounts, early episode releases, a bunch of other things going on. But if that's not your vibe, that's really okay. We've got some wonderful merch. If I do, if I do say so myself. If you're watching the, uh, the YouTube version... You can see my super cute t-shirt that I have right now. It's uh, available for you. We've got the my favorite flower, the sunflower. And on the back, there's a really cool logo. It's amazing. I'll put it right here if you're watching on the YouTubes. Anyways, <laughs> if you're not watching on the YouTubes, um, you can check out the merch store in the show notes. And as always, I love to hear from you in my DMs on Instagram or TikTok. You can find me over there too. And now... Without further ado, for the last time in season six, I would like to tell you to do something that makes you happy. Take care of yourself. Drink your water. Drink extra water today because I won't be able to tell you for a few weeks. Okay? Drink it. All right? Okay? And I will see you for season seven of For the Love of History podcast in October. Okay? I love you so much. Bye! Why is there a metronome right now? Oh, okay. <laughs>